Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our Network Access Control webcast. In this webcast, I have Sirwish and Ron to talk about everything that is changing and everything that we can do to help you onboard your users, guests or employees onto your network in a safe way. Welcome. Thank you, Karen. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Let's by defining what access control is. I think that would be a great start. Um, and it's an important question, you know, what, what is access control? And uh, when we talk to customers, um, we understand that they are looking for a much broader and more powerful definition of access control than what has been around in the past in the old days. So today, in, in, the, in the current era, access control refers to many vectors. So you want to look at who the user is. So user and group information is a very important part of access control. The second is location. Where is the user connecting from? Uh, gone are the old ways of thinking about, you know, any device, any user, anywhere, allow him access. That's no longer deemed as a, as a good security model. So security needs to take into consideration where is this access request coming from. So you do not want a situation wherein user credentials have been compromised and these credentials are being used by an attacker from some other country. You want to be able to stop that. So location becomes a very important uh, metric. The third is the device. Uh, companies are are becoming more and more sensitive about accessing information only from compliant devices. So if the user is connecting from a non-compliant device, then there may be more risk because you don't know the state of that device. Is it is it in a, uh, in a good secure state or is it, being a comp is it a compromised device? The fourth is what is the application that is being accessed? Um, this is important because it's not a broad stroke uh, of a security policy. You want security policy to be fine-grained and specific to the application as well. And then becomes the, comes the question of how do you authenticate and authorize? And that may change based on any of the, the other items that we talked about, location, device, and application. You may want to authenticate uh, personal devices, for example, in a different way versus how you would authenticate a corporate device. Or you may want to authenticate a specific application that is having more sensitive data with multi-factor authentication versus another application which may just require an Active Directory authentication. So these are some of the key tenets of um, access control. And what we are trying to achieve here is a complete context. In addition to this context, you also want to um, look for threat prevention. Uh, this is now recognized by many customers uh, as a very important component of access control. Um, the very purpose of having an access control in place is so that uh, breaches don't happen. So you do want to include threat prevention as part of access control. It's not just authentication authorization, but also being able to inspect what application is being accessed, what URL is being accessed, is there any malware that is being transmitted or downloaded from the endpoint to the application. So, so these are all the uh, different aspects that we would define uh, come together to create a complete context and become access control. So it's, we're not saying no anymore. We're saying yes, but based on as much factors that we can account for to assess the risk. That's right. And this is where context come into play. That's right. And you also mentioned prevention of attacks. So it's not only coming from a user or unknown user. We have a lot of question around lateral movement. And this is actually a good segue for some of the myth that we have collected from you about access control. So I'm going to ask you several of them, tell me true or false, and how we are addressing them. So a lot of people look at access control as only applicable to firewalls that are connected outside of the organization. So if I have internal firewall, it's not needed on them. True or false? Um, it, is, uh, it is a wrong opinion to believe that access control is only necessary from the outside, uh, from a firewall perspective. Um, at the end of the day, the company is trying to protect its intellectual information, mm -hmm. intellectual property uh, that's very valuable for its business. Whether it is being accessed from outside or inside, it does not matter. You want to have same consistent policies protecting that inf intellectual property from outside and inside. So access control has to be throughout the organization. It should not depend on the source or is it only outside or inside. And this is going to the inside threat 
coming from someone who intentionally is connecting from the inside of your organization or someone who is unknowingly just moving devices in and out and connecting from That's right. inside of the organization. Ron, do you have anything to add to it? I, I think Sarvesh is, is right on target. Across our entire enterprise, we have different services that we want to provide granular access controls to, not only from who the user is, but also, as we discussed a little bit earlier, what the device is. Mm -hmm. And then even though we're comfortable with the device and we're comfortable with the user accessing a very specific either network segment or application on our network, we also want to monitor to make sure that that device didn't get compromised somewhere else. And, and while we there's nothing on the device that says it's not compliant, i.e. the antivirus is out of date or traps or mm -hmm. anything like that. The fact that the device may have been compromised earlier, we still want to detect that and check that as it's trying to access those critical resources. True. Makes sense. Second myth. <clears throat> VPN equal access control. Um, I think customers um, understand the, the need for access control when the user is connecting from remote, but it is just one aspect of access control. It, it, it does not complete the, the entire security paradigm. So it's needed, but it's not everything that you need. That's right. That's right. Okay. And we will talk more on this point to clearly understand what is included with a full solution for access control. Um, you need to have a complicated set of policy to get really granular control. True or false? Um, I think it is, it's again a myth. It's false. Um, what customers are looking for is consistent policies, not complicated policies, especially as the size of the organization grows and they have maybe 50, 100, 200 locations. They want to have secure, consistent policies, not complicated policies that require multiple solutions or uh, different ways of managing. This is a good comment because some of the questions were, how many tools do I need to get full access control? And this may imply also the answers around policies. If you have multiple tools that you are using to get this full solution, you may require different policies or different management across right. to see the end-to-end -end offering. That's right. But if you manage it from one place and you have all of the pieces, it's then become easier. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, that is, that is actually a, a great testament to why customers prefer the solution is in the old days, if you were to achieve it using the legacy solutions like a point VPN solution or a point NAC solution, you'd need a VPN for remote access control. You'd need a firewall for threat prevention. You need a NAC solution inside your organization for access control inside. And each one of them could be from different vendors depending on the customer's choice. And they are completely different products that need to be managed, configured, operationalized in different ways. And this is a huge management overhead for customers. Instead, what we offer to customers is a single solution, consistent policies defined in one place. Uh, you have full visibility, 24 by 7, and you're able to manage it with a single pane of glass. So it's much more easier to achieve this with, uh, with the solution that we recommend to customers. So hold that thought yeah. because we're going to talk about policies as we progress with this conversation. I just want to pause for a second and talk about market trends because we were talking about globalization and mobile users and employees and guests. And I just want to make sure that we spend five minutes to talk about everything that is going on that require us to change and adapt our network access control. So trends. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question, Karen. So, so trends there, we see um, at least three to five new trends. One is uh, mobility is here to stay. Um, employees work, access work from wherever they are. So mobility is, is a trend that is, that's not new. It's been around for a few years, but we see the, the propagation of, of mobile devices or different form factors being used for work. Um, you know, even devices like virtual reality devices are being used, uh, mobile devices and so on and so forth. These devices will continue to come as, as, the, as time goes on, and all of them will require uh, secure access control. Um, so mobility is definitely a trend we see. The second is companies now collaborate with third parties uh, more openly in the sense that uh, it's a global economy. So your partner may be an outside uh, company in a faraway country and you want to enable onboarding him securely and allowing him access only to the information that he needs to see. So third-party access is becoming more and more critical for customers to have access control. Um, of course, 
the employee personal access. Uh, what started out as courtesy internet access for employees using their personal devices has now gone uh, to the next level wherein the companies also want to have uh, both an employee's device will have personal applications and it may have some work applications. And he chooses, switches between work and personal life more transparently than they used to be before. So we see uh, usage of personal devices by employees as, as another trend. So, so these are some of the trends that I can think of. And a lot of yeah. the time we have both. So if you think about how we work today, I will have my laptop issued by Palo Alto Network and I will have my mobile device, which is mine. Right. And we're actually using both of them for security because the multi-factor authentication will work with my mobile device, which is private. And I could be on both of them sitting in the same location and get different access That's right. from my computer or my phone. Ron is responsible probably for a lot of it, so some, of it. some insights <laughs> <That's right. laughs> into how you use all of it and how you see it manifested for us. And, and I would add, it's not only providing that access or provisioning that access to you while you're here, it's wherever you happen to be. If you're traveling overseas to one of our other offices or maybe even over in another state here in the U.S., when you go into that office, you want the exact same access with whatever device you happen to have that you had here in the California office. Right, right. You just disclose where we are broadcasting from. <laughs> <laughs> California headquarters. Um, this is a good segue to ask, how do you see the difference in the team that are interacting with Network Access Control Project? So here at Palo Alto Networks, we've got an information technology team that manages a lot of our internal infrastructure and a security team that's responsible for the monitoring of all that infrastructure. And then, of course, if we do see anything from a network perspective, responding to that. So we have two different teams that work together, collaborate, a network operations center and a security operations center. And they work very, very closely in identifying concerns, having changes or updates made in our infrastructure to address those concerns, uh, and to ensure, again, we have that consistent access securely for all of our employees. So you will see more of kind of like SOC involvement in those RFI, RFP phases of a network access control project. You will get more input in from those teams. Absolutely. Security engineering teams and our security operations center teams are, are required whenever we go out into looking at technologies to provide access and to provide security within our infrastructure. It's a good thing to you know, take into account, work with them to make sure that from an early stage you include everything that they need to have in order to monitor the organization consistently. Yep. Okay. This is, um, I want to go back now to what I promised the audience and talk about the policy. So we mentioned many different vectors that we consider as we assess risk and it all has to do with risk assessment That's if right. you're saying you know to me like ron was if you're in the headquarter i want to give you access to those kind of application but from the same device if you move to a different location if it's our location follow Alto network you will get the same access if you are in a hotel somewhere i may restrict you and i may say you know what i'm i don't don't want you to have access to them That's in this in this location so we're accounting for who i am right as a user, what department I am at, what is deemed to be needed. We look at my device, yep. uh, we look at where I'm sitting, yep. um, and we talked about what application I'm going to access to. So That's it's right. not regardless that you're just j saying based on one of them. And if all of them can have multiple values, the risk assessment now start to be very dynamic and very granular. That's right. How does it work? Um, so so the Global Protect Solution is, um, it's a very simple solution. Every firewall uh, next-gen platform from Palo Alto Networks has it built into the platform itself. And on the endpoints, you deploy an agent for managed devices. Um, so these agents are capable of providing um, all these uh, four uh, bits of information. The user information, the location information, um, and the device information, who owns the device ownership information, and of course, the app ID technology allows us to identify the application. So this is built in the solution. Uh, so all you have to do is enable Global Protect uh, service on the next-gen platform, deploy the endpoints, and this comes with the solution, our ability to gather this information in real time and at connection time. So the only thing Ron needs to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, is saying, 
this is high risk, so I want this behavior. This is a lower risk, so I want this behavior. And then the policy automatically for each connection that I'm as a user attempting to achieve is automatically calculating all of those That's risk right. score. That's right. And then defining what I have access to. And, and so as an example, using the, the situation you described earlier where you're here in the office and then later you're maybe at a hotel or a Starbucks trying to get access, I actually want you to have the same level of access because you need to be productive regardless of whether you're here or whether you're at your hotel. And typically that productivity is based on the same collection of apps or services you, you get access to everywhere. So because obviously the access from a hotel has a higher degree of risk, I don't want to restrict your access. What I want to do is I want to make sure it's you. So I may employ multi-factor authentication That's right. to ensure that it is you accessing from Starbucks and not somebody else. That's right. That's right. So going back to yeah. saying yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're not saying no anymore. Yes. The whole, you know, posters of IT saying no and slowing down the business is being removed now and elevated. That's right. That's right. As we just give you more option to verify mm -hmm. that this is safe and, and secure. That's right. So we were talking about uh, device and user. What additional context can we get into? Uh, the decision-making when we define risk? Um, one additional context that is very important is the compliance status, which is, which is not a static um, status. The compliance status of the device can change. For example, a jailbroken device, an employee device that got in the wrong hands mm -hmm. and got jailbroken, now no longer is a trusted device that can be allowed to access sensitive information. So monitoring the compliance status is a dynamic uh, context that you should be capable of utilizing in your policies at every connection attempt and every access attempt. Yeah. This is very detailed, assuming yeah. that there are so many different manufacturers and OSs. Who is, who is defining what is appropriate? I think um, ultimately it is a customer who defines the security policy end-to-end -end mm -hmm. in terms of what devices need to be allowed on the network who is allowed to use what device, from what locations um, access must be allowed. Like Ron was mentioning, there may be a customer who says, I want to have same level of access. If my user is in an unknown space, then have additional authentication. On the other end of the spectrum, you may also find a, a highly security, um, the policies are like at a, at a different level where they want to restrict access to a particular application only from a given location. We often talk to customers in, in certain uh, federal spaces mm -hmm. in, in, in defense industries where they are very particular that application needs to be accessed only from that building and should not be allowed access from anywhere else even if your user gets on the network. So, so those are all some examples that I can think of. So as a user, I have the control to decide which null byte we can to exactly. what extent based on how I evaluate That's risk. right. That's right. With all of this information that we're collecting, how simple it is to actually onboard me as a user? Uh, that's a great question. In fact, this has been one of the struggles that customers in the have had in the past when they tried a multi-vendor solution is, is just piecing all these different um, systems together. Um, what we offer is um, not only the integrated capabilities in our solution, but we have simple connectors to other sources of information. For example, if you have an Active Directory that has information about your devices, users, and groups, you can leverage those in policies. If you have an MDM that has intelligence about mobile devices, you can leverage that in your policies. You know, if you have a PKI that can be used for issuing certificates, we can leverage that as part of the uh, authentication framework. So we really have um, tried to uh, utilize the existing enterprise infrastructure and leverage them for, for this comprehensive security policy. Um, and, and um, just, to, just for, for some, of, some of us who are new to Global Protect, uh, Global Protect solution has, um, I mentioned, two components. One is the firewall platform and the other is agent. The firewall platform has two functions. There is a logical function called as a portal and there is a gateway. Uh, typically, a customer will have probably one portal and that is where he defines settings. If a user connects, what settings needs, needs to be given to him? So that's the function of a portal. Gateway is, is the actual um, VPN gateway, the connection point. So customers typically will have one portal, multiple gateways, but in that portal they will have different settings. And we now, um, with the release of uh, PanOS 
Even the Global Protect portal is capable of utilizing that complete context, which is the user, the device, the location, for deciding what settings need to be offered to this uh, user, what gateways can he connect to. So that choice can be made at the portal level. And then the, use, the client then picks the best gateway um, that is suitable for the user based on where he is and establishes a connection. And the gateway can also now provide differentiated access based on the context information we talked about. So if, when, if going back to the example of you gracefully allowing me to go to the same application if I'm sitting on a Starbucks, how would that flow would look like? Well, so first let me give a, an, an example pulling from one of the earlier statements that Sarvesh made about differentiated access for, mm -hmm. for instance, contractors versus employees. So we have at a much higher level of risk acceptance with our own devices that we manage versus potentially a contractor where we don't manage that box. They, they bring their own box in. So, however, they still need to access some resources within our, within our network. So at the portal level, when that Global Protect client initially connects to the portal, we identify whether that user is an employee or a contractor, and that's done with our, with our uh, directory services. And the portal will return a different set of gateways to those different user sets. We say, hey, if you're a contractor, because you're going to authenticate differently, we're going to send you to this very small subset of gateways for you. If you're an employee, you've got a much more robust authentication process, one that's much more seamless. We're going to let you get access to this much broader set that actually is more global as well. That's right. So this is kind of like a first cleanup. You're saying, right. I'm seeing who you are, I start to understand what you're looking at, and I defer you to a second tier that will be more granular after I made this decision. And within it, you can decide if it's you know partners versus employees, different departments of employees, or different way that you decide to cut and dice your business That's in right. order to make it logical for you. That's right. And, and I think uh, uh, a term that most customers would be familiar with is segmentation. And this is dynamically doing that segmentation based on the context. So how would, how would the gateway be involved now? That you funnel me to the gateway, it's in the gateway where you define uh, how I authenticate, as you were mentioning, mm -hmm. yeah. what is the process, how automated it is, what is required for me. All of this heavy lifting is done at based the gateway. on at That's the gateway right. level. That's right. So gateways are the, are the, um, are the control, um, control points or... Uh, you know, the control center where you're defining the security policies. So gateways are uh, protecting your applications. So that's where you define the security policies, and that is where the evaluation of the context is done, and an allowed deny decision is made for every, uh, every access request. And we also have multi-factor authentication built into our firewall, which is a unique capability that That's I right. just wanted to pause and mention. It's yep. not a part of that session, but it's definitely a cool feature to have when you have the solution built in. That's right. That's right. This is, uh, in fact, uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, the, the cool thing about MFA authentication is, is it's very dynamic. Uh, if the context changes, like Ron was mm -hmm. giving an example, on demand, you, you, you could have an MFA request triggered. And in order for customers to extend multi-factor authentication to applications, they do not have to change anything in the application. So we can dynamically do the MFA based on policy. So, yeah. so it's definitely something we would uh, recommend customers to take a look at. This is a request, yeah. by the way, that we got from you, our customers, when you were saying that it takes you three to four months to onboard a new multi-factor authentication vendor yeah. into your security solution. And with the capability being a part of our firewall, it's cutting down to almost immediate or still work, but almost immediate. And I, it's even more than just taking two or three months to be able to integrate an MFA solution or onboard a new capability. There are capabilities out there that just don't integrate mm -hmm. with an MFA solution. Right. So we can do it at the network layer, either internally or as you're coming in from the outside. That's right. More granularity. Yeah. Um, compliance information. So I want us to spend a second on it, knowing sure. that our customers really cares about it. So let's serve them and talk about compliance. Absolutely. So um, we have built in the ability to assess compliance in the solution itself. The Global Protect Agent itself can assess compliance. It, it doesn't do it one time at connection, but rather it does it on a continuous basis. As I mentioned before, the compliance status is a dynamic 
um, risk status that you want to evaluate on an ongoing basis. So compliance information can be assessed by the client and provided uh, on a continuous basis to the next gen firewall platform. We also have the ability to uh, collect compliance information from other sources such as Active Directory or MDMs mm -hmm. and, and essentially use them in real time for policies. So let's talk about other innovation that we have added in addressing some of the challenges brought by you. One of them was I have mixed devices. How do I manage access control for mixed devices? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. In, in the past, um, the old way of doing it was is essentially having uh, duplicate infrastructure. So if you wanted MFA, you would have a set of portals and gateways that would be configured with MFA. You would have some gateways configured with a certificate and so on. So our customers had to isolate and duplicate infrastructure. But with 9.0, we support mixing different authentication methods and using the appropriate one based on the context. So we would highly recommend customers to take a look at uh, some of the mixed device support that we have introduced in, in 9.0, where we can say, okay, if there's a personal device authenticated using this method, if it is um, if it's a mobile device authenticated with this method, if it's a corporate issued laptop, you authenticate with a different method. So, so you can mix and match the authentication methods uh, in a very rich manner. Uh, using some of the 9.0 features. Yeah. And the benefit probably tie into manageability as well. So it's not only the simplification and removal right. of duplication in the infrastructure. Ron, how do you see it in terms of management? So the ability to manage the access by device and by person allows us to really support our users in the most efficient way that they want to accomplish their job. Now, we will have policies in that say a personal device cannot access this part of our infrastructure, this app. And, and we control that through, through Global Protect. If you authenticate with a personal device, we can choose perhaps use MFA, Okta, Duo, you pick your, your MFA vendor. You can authenticate with that MFA provider, but we won't let you get access to certain infrastructure because of the device that we recognize is not a managed device mm -hmm. versus, again, your corporate issued laptop, assuming that it meets all the compliance requirements real time. Then you can get access into the more restricted areas of our network in a much more seamless way that you don't have to pull out your whatever app you're using for your multi-factor if you're using like a duo. So this is actually a, a good point. Assuming that I'm remote, I'm going back to my example selfishly, assuming that I'm remote and I have a personal device and it does not meet the compliance requirement. And I don't know what they are because, again, we mentioned that they could change. So you can say, hey, there is a new OS and now you have to be on this new OS in order to, in order for me to allow you to authenticate to the network. And I have no clue and I refuse to upgrade my OS on my device for some reason, lack of time or just mm -hmm. didn't pay attention to it. And then you block me. How would I know? Like, do we have the option to let me know that this is because of the OS, or what do I need to do in order to get permission? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. And I think these are the um, operational aspects which will make or break our deployment. And the approach, the philosophy we have taken is it is not an all or nothing um, situation, wherein if a device connects and if it is out of compliance, then you as an administrator can decide what you want to do. Uh, denying access is not your only option. You have other options. You may restrict access. Uh, for example, you may have some update servers. Um, if this machine is not patched, therefore it's out of compliance, then at least allow access to the patching systems so that the user who is remote can, can actually become compliant and, and get his normal access restored. So we, we have a workflow wherein we can detect the device out of compliance then dynamically restrict access to whatever is allowed to be uh, when the device connects out of compliance. And then when the device comes back into compliance, normal access is restored. So this whole workflow is automated. So you do not have, you know, all of a sudden you have a lot of help desk calls um, from people because, the, you know, there are a bunch of patches that did not make it to the endpoint. And, and where you don't have automation for whatever technical reason uh, is in place, yeah. the message that goes to the user tells the user what Why? what check that they failed so that they know exactly what they need to go to do in order to get back to being productive. That's right. This is very helpful. Thank you. 
for me. <laughs> I'm Thank sure you. it is for some of your employees. Uh, there's definitely a lot more as well. Again, we are limited by the, the time we have, uh, but we would encourage you to go look at other videos and other uh, information we have. For example, a lot of automation can be done. When a device is out of compliance, you can automatically create a help desk ticket. Before the user having to call the, the help desk, the help desk already knows that this device is out of compliance and they, they can proactively solve the problem. So a lot of capabilities can be done through some of our APIs and other mechanisms we have. Yeah. Thank you. So we mentioned the Global Protect license, but there are a lot of features that comes with our firewall. True. How, how, what is the difference and when do I actually need to purchase the license or for what benefit? Sure. Um, the, the good thing with Global Protect is the licensing is a very, very simple licensing model. Um, we don't really uh, do licensing based on number of concurrent sessions uh, or the number of devices um, that will be connecting to the, uh, to the Nixon uh, firewall platform. It's a very simple licensing model where the base license, base set of features is free. So if you have bought a VM or any, any Palo Alto network firewall, Global Protect base features are available to you free. And there are a set of advanced capabilities which require a single license. So if you use any of those advanced capabilities, you need to have the Global Protect subscription license installed on the firewall. Um, we will provide, uh, I think, if you go to our uh, web page, you'll find a table that basically says these are the basic features and these are the advanced features which require a license. And if you have questions, this is a good pause for me to remind you that you can ask us questions in the Q&A tab and we will address them at the end of this session. So there is a lot more information available for you to download. There are links for direct access to this content and also feel free to ask us questions. We will be waiting for them at the end of the session. You mentioned VM, so I do want to touch about a mixed deployment because when we think about Global Protect and we talked about firewalls, there are many ways for us as a company, and Ron can probably talk to this as well, and our customers to choose how they deploy NGFW capabilities today. Some of them may be hardware, some of them VM, some of them would be Global Protect Cloud Service or Prisma Access in its new name. Um, and I'm assuming that historically, or if you don't work with our solution, you need to manage multiple different uh, access controls, policies. How does it change when you manage it consistently? Well, so we give the customer, the user of the platform, complete flexibility to be able to support how they do work. For instance, uh, Global Protect can be provided in multiple different, I guess you would call it form factors. Mm -hmm. First one is an on-prem appliance, and we have some of those. Uh, we have those on-prem appliances where it makes sense that we have zoning and segmentation requirements internal in the network. So that's where we have an on-prem appliance. Mm -hmm. We also have the ability to deploy that same appliance as a virtual machine. So that could be on-prem, or you could deploy that out in the cloud. Let's say you have a, a, a remote office where you only have a small number of employees. It's not worth the overhead and the infrastructure to deploy a physical on-prem box, let's say somewhere in South America. So rather, you deploy it as a VM up into a public cloud environment so that you're providing that same level of service for those remote employees, mm -hmm. but they don't have to travel all the way to, let's say, Texas, where that other gateway may happen to be. Right. And then the third uh, capability is Prisma Access, which is Palo Alto Networks manages the infrastructure for you. It scales it based on what you need. You as the customer, you manage your policies. So from your perspective, if you manage uh, access control policy for me, and I travel across our organization, I can connect to all of those different deployment or form factors. And from your perspective, you only manage one policy for me? This yeah, is... it's great for both of us. As a manager of the infrastructure, I've got one place that I go to manage access, regardless of which of those platform capabilities we just talked about. As a user, it doesn't matter to you which one you're connecting to because the policies are absolutely the same. It's just, the yeah. speed and the efficiency is better for you. That's right. That's right. And and I think the the keyword that he used uh, is, is a very good choice of word: speed and efficiency. That matters. So when people work, and sometimes uh, security and usability becomes a trade-off. Um, and and we've architected global protect with with both of them in mind that we need to have the highest level of security and the highest level of usability 
where the user literally has zero touch. He doesn't have to think about where am I right now, where do I need to connect, all that is taken care of by the solution. This also eliminates cheating. Because historically, when it was hard, people will go around mm -hmm. to get access that they need, even if it's not to the app because they couldn't get to the application. But there was some negotiation between IT rules and what I actually want access to that is seamlessly and easy for me to follow. And I think that bringing those two together guaranteed it as an employee or a guest, I follow your guideline because I have no, it doesn't affect my day to day. That's right. So if, if we are at the, almost at the end of the session, but if you want to have five takeaways for our audience to remember, what are the most, like the top five things as they deploy network access control projects? Definitely. I mean, this is definitely a lot for customers to take in, if, especially if you, if you are coming from uh, a two-vendor or three-vendor solution. Uh, it may be a little overwhelming. How do I piece this whole thing together? So, so what we, when we have conversations with customers, what we discuss with them is first define the context that matters to you. Does policies based on users matter to you? Does policies based on applications matter to you? Does policies based on device matter to you? Location, does it matter to you? So identify which aspects of this context is important for your organization based on the sensitivity of your business. And then once you have defined that, then define policies. And we usually recommend customers to uh, implement one layer at a time. Define um, user-based policies followed by compliance policies followed by more advanced policies. So this way you can make sure that you know all these layers are deployed, manageable, and then you add more advanced capabilities. So definitely um, one of the things we say is identify the context and the second thing is identify which in what sequence would you like to roll out that, that context. And um, the third thing is um, compliance has become more and more important for our customers, uh, depending on which, uh, which uh, business you are in. Um, you, you will have federal regulations or state government regulations. So um, look at what your compliance requirements are and figure out how to achieve that compliance using this uh, single solution. So those are some of the things that uh, come to my mind. Yeah. So basically, first do your homework and figure out who needs to get access to right. what and what is important for you and what do you assess as being high risk. We probably can help with, you know, identifying this, us or your partners. There are some industry-specific consideration that you may want to bring into place. Then after you identify it and negotiate it with the different team, letting them know what is the new process and how it's going to be, start deploying it, but in phases. In phases. So yes. kind of like check a box at a time. That's right. Definitely. And as you get more granular, make sure that obviously you use it also for compliance and auditing and ever, everything that you need That's right. um, to benefit from it. The, the solution is very granular. Um, so thank you for adding the comments that we are here to help, especially if you consolidate offering that you currently have into the firewall. Um, and our team, NSEs, can help you do that. Absolutely. Any other comments before we move to Q&A? I would add two additional cases on top of what Sarvesh had mentioned, and it, it goes back to one of the other comments we just had a few moments ago. Sarvesh started off with a VPN appliance, a firewall, mm -hmm. uh, all those different parts of the infrastructure that you need. You don't need that. And so going back to what I mentioned earlier, to be able to manage this infrastructure, it is so much more streamlined and efficient for me. Yes. And then, of course, what we said earlier and you highlighted, if it's not easy for you, then it's probably not going to meet our security goals. So it also has to be easy and efficient for the user. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, we will meet them again in the Q&A section. So you get a couple of more minutes to put your questions in, and we will see you on the other side. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the Q&A section of our webcast. Yes, this is the most perfect moment for you to type in your question. You can do it inside the Ask a Question tab. To all of you overachiever who already submitted your question, thank you. If you look on your screen under the Attachment tab, you can find the slide deck from today's session and more useful links. 
please also use your right to vote and actively participate answering our poll question as they appear on your screen. With that, let's start answering some questions. Right, thank you, Kel. Hi there, um, this is Sarvesh again. So thank you for sending in the questions. We'll, we'll do our best to, to go through the questions and answer them one by one. Uh, if the answer does not uh, fully answer your question, you need more details or more clarifications, please reach out to the uh, Palo Alto Networks account representative and we'll be happy to get on a more detailed conversation with you. Okay, so with that being said, I'll, I'll just uh, go through the uh, questions. Um, we have a question uh, that says, how do you manage local printing for my remote users while the gateway is running in full tunnel? Um, we specifically have a feature uh, called as no direct access to local networks. And this is a configurable feature where you can actually uh, specify the group of users who are allowed to do uh, activities such as local printing or any local network access. So we would encourage you to take a look at that, that feature, no direct access to local networks, and enable that for users whom you want to be able to do local printing. Um, so so that, that would be the, uh, the approach to take. Uh, there's documentation if you go to our website, which will uh, provide details on how to configure it. If it does not solve the problem, if you have some more, uh, uh, some more questions, like I said, please reach out and we'll, we'll work with you directly. Okay, um, so the next question is, does the Global Protect client on PanOS rely on the Java platform on, window mach on Windows machines? We, the uh, the Global Protect client is, does not rely on the Java platform um, on Windows. Um, the only uh, it's it's a, a pretty much a self-reliant package. I believe the uh, this uh, foundation elements of Windows platforms such as the C C++ uh, libraries that come pre-installed with Windows. That's the only requirement. We don't have a requirement for Java. The next question is: Is there any feature that involves or can be specifically for hospital and healthcare functions? Um, the the um, I think the, we have many customers in the, uh, in the healthcare vertical who have deployed Global Protect uh, for various use cases for securing their hospital infrastructure, um, access control to the hospital resources from outside, as well as protecting, um, protecting the, uh, the internal access, uh, how to provide secure access for patients and hospital staff. So we do have uh, Global Protect being used for healthcare functions. Um, we would request you to reach out to our Palo Alto account you know, uh, representative and discuss your use case, and we can help you in identifying exactly how to use this product for your requirements. Um, next question is, will you be covering the cloud version of Global Protect? I think purely in the interest of time, we have focused this session primarily on the access control solution using Global Protect subscription, but uh, uh, please stay tuned and sign up for there are many more webinars coming. There will be several webinars on, on Prisma Access, uh, which is the, uh, the cloud version of the, the on-prem subscription solution. So we'll definitely be covering them in uh, one or more uh, subsequent sessions. The next question is, what EPA version or Palo Alto Network software version is required for MFA? So MFA, we want to, I, I want to get a little bit more specific. Um, there's uh, typically in the industry, people refer to two-factor authentication, um, and then more recently, multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication can extend beyond two factors. And the two-factor authentication is supported with both RADIUS and SAML um, from way back, I believe from, uh, uh, from ATO or so. Um, we support the RADIUS and SAML authentication, and, uh, and also the MFA as well. Um, when we refer to MFA, Palo Alto typically refers to multi-factor authentication um, at the time of application access. And that's a very advanced feature that we talked briefly about in this uh, webinar. Uh, that feature is supported from A.0 as well. So hope that answers your question. Um, the question is, is there any particular brand that works better with Palo Alto Firewall's uh, MFA feature? Um, so again, uh, there are two types of MFA. One is the RADIUS and SAML based. Um, we are 
we support any vendor um, that uses those uh, standards. So we, we wouldn't typically recommend one over the other. Uh, it's, it's entirely up to you for you to evaluate your requirements against the options you have. Um, and as far as the, uh, the application access um, MFA, we have direct integrations with um, uh, three vendors. MFA vendors, and on our website, we have details on the which vendors we have direct integration with, and we also have um, the uh, specific versions um, where we are compatible with them. So please uh, take a look at our website. And this is Ron. I'll pick up the next question, and the question reads, if personal phones don't access files on the network, should they be allowed on your network Wi-Fi connections? And if they do, can that traffic be monitored? question maybe had a little more words in it, so I just summarized it. Um, well, so first of all, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend putting an unmanaged device on your corporate network. Um, that's one of the things we do as a very fundamental security practice. However, a lot of organizations do want to provide network access as a convenience for their employees. So there are lots of different ways with Wi-Fi infrastructure that that can be done. Um, you can set up a separate SSID with its own VLAN and route that traffic directly out to the Internet. Through your gateway appliance, you can apply whatever security controls uh, you choose to, as well as coordination with your legal counsel to make sure that monitoring of personal devices is appropriate within your geographical region. Now, that doesn't mean that those mobile devices won't be able to access your corporate infrastructure. If you want them to, and going back to the, the topic of the webinar, um, we would install Global Protect as an optional application for that user, and they can come back in through Global Protect, and then Global Protect is used as a, uh, a security control to allow access only to those resources that you choose to expose to a mobile device. So, thank you, Ron. Um, okay, I'll take the next question. Um, when using MFA for Global Protect, how often does the user get prompted to enter their authentication code? Um, so this is where we have provided a very flexible framework where you as a customer, based on your security policy, can decide. We have seen customers who say, I want to re-authenticate using 2FA every eight hours or 24 hours. So it's entirely up to you. We provide a framework where you can decide as a customer uh, how frequently you want the two-factor authentication to be re-prompted. Um, again, I'll refer you to the uh, some of our tech docs. We'll, we'll provide you information on how to uh, how to configure that timing. Um, next is an interesting question. So, uh, why did Palo Alto allow my Linux clients to free uh, prior to 9.0 code? Um, again, um, just want to clarify here. So, we have two types of Linux clients that we support. One is third-party Linux clients. Um, so, for example, the the uh, um, the strong swans, the VPNCs, and and those sort of XR-based solutions, uh, they can connect to Global Protect. There is no license required. It's free, uh, not just prior to 9.0. Basically, it is it is it will continue to be a, a free license. So, if you're using third-party Linux clients, um, you can connect and have a VPN. You would not have some of the advanced features uh, such as HIP which fundamentally require a license for any client. So, so I just want to make sure I can provide more clarity on that. Um, okay, so the next question is also an interesting question. So the does, does the access control apply to users who only use their mobile device for access to emails only? For example, Office 365. It's a great question, and I think this is a very common deployment scenario wherein Mobile devices are just using emails, and they're not really uh, um, accessing work. So what what we uh, what we realize when we have conversations with customers is that customers notice that mobile devices are under equally under attack as the laptops. And so the importance and the sensitivity of protecting a mobile device is is um, as applicable as as the laptops themselves. So the question is. Um, do you want your uh, corporate issued mobile devices to be secured, uh, or do you want to allow them to connect to the internet uh, and, and 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 have to you know accept the risk that comes with it? So purely from a security point of view, we recommend that it's very important for you to look at and have a strategy in place in terms of how are you going to secure 
your mobile devices that your employees are using, uh, particularly if it is corporate issued mobile devices or personal devices which has SaaS applications which are being used for work. So if you fit in any of these two uh, uh, use cases, then we would recommend you to take a look at, you know, how can I use Global Protect for securing my mobile devices? But the next question is, can I deploy Global Protect gateways in public cloud? The answer is absolutely yes. So you can, uh, you can in any of the public cloud infrastructure, AWS, GCP, Azure, you can uh, spin up a firewall VM and, um, and configure it as a Global Protect gateway. Uh, and then you can also um, have the client automatically decide which is the nearest gateway, whether it's in the public cloud or on-prem, the client can intelligently pick which gateway it needs to connect to. Um, just scrolling through the questions. What version of Global Protect do you recommend? Um, we, we have recently released, um, so the 5, five dot, um, the release uh, 5.0 is the latest major version, so we have released uh, 5.03 recently, uh, but we also recommend customers to talk to our support organization. They also um, you know, have a uh, support recommended version, so I would re request you to go take a look at the support webpage of Palo Alto, and you will have the support recommendations on the specific versions for both the firewall and Cloud Protect. Um, the next question is, do you support per app VPN? Uh, yes, we support per app VPN on mobile devices. This is a great feature, particularly on uh, personal devices where you do not want the personal traffic to go over the, uh, over the VPN tunnel. You want only the company uh, traffic to go over the VPN, and the way to do that is with per app VPN. Uh, scrolling through the questions, again, uh, if we don't go, get to your question, um, we will, we will uh, please feel free to connect with the Palo Alto representative and uh, we will specifically set up a time to discuss more about your question in case we don't get to it today. Uh, next question is, can I integrate the Global Protect solution with Intune? Um, and uh, the answer to that is yes. So you can deploy the Global Protect app using Intune. You can uh, push configurations using Intune, uh, whether it is a remote access or always on or even per app VPN, you can, uh, you can push that configuration using uh, Intune. So Glow Protect is in integrated with, it, with Intune. I think we talked already about the third-party VPN clients. So on our website, we have details on which third-party clients we can work with. The, uh, so what we recommend customers is uh, is when they deploy Global Protect Gateway, sometimes they are migrating from an existing um, vendor, in which case the existing vendor's clients can connect to Global Protect Gateways. And once that configuration is in place, they can deploy the Global Protect agent on the endpoint. And the next question is, do you support clientless VPN for enabling third-party access? If yes, does that require a license? Um, yes, uh, clientless VPN is, is specifically meant for securely enabling third-party access and BYOD access to corporate applications. And uh, it is a, it's, a, uh, it's an advanced feature, and it does require the Global Protect subscription license on the firewalls. Okay. I'm just going through the questions to, to see um, additional ones that uh, we missed and we want to answer. Can Global Protect be deployed internal facing as well as external facing at the same time? Yes, the same firewall can, can be an external gateway and an internal gateway if you choose to do that. Next question is, what is the primary difference between Global Protect and Prisma. Um, so, so we have uh, two options for customers. One is to own the, the firewalls and the Global Protect infrastructure, buy the firewalls, own them, and manage them, um, and, and of course, uh, define security policies. So if you're, if you're a customer who would prefer that, then you know, our, our account team can help you find, do the right sizing and, and help you find the right firewalls the licenses that you need, and, and you own this infrastructure. So that is one route where you own the infrastructure. 
The second route is Prisma Access, wherein Palo Alto Networks is actually owning the, the firewall infrastructure. We own and manage uh, that infrastructure. Um, all you have to do is route your traffic to the Prisma Access Cloud, and you still control the security policies. You don't have the overhead of managing your own firewalls. So you have both the options. Again, we would recommend you to talk to um, uh, our uh, sales team or account team, and uh, we can uh, we can kind of uh, help you in uh, in making this, these choices. And uh, it's not one or the other. We do see customers having hybrid deployments, wherein for some sites they have on-prem firewalls um, that they own and manage, and for remote sites and some uh, for mobile users, they, they could use uh, Prisma Access. Um, um, any comments? Yeah, I just want to add that I know that we changed the naming. So just to make sure that within Prisma, we have Prisma Access, which is the global to the cloud service. Uh, you also have the VM, and you have public cloud, and you have the hardware. So just emphasizing more of what has been said here, you have um, the freedom to choose your deployment option, and you can mix and match where all of the capabilities are consistent, allowing you to have a uh, consistent policy across, and the management is simplified for you because you can, you can manage all of them from one place. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. All right. Um, next question is, is it possible to authenticate my users from my Active Directory? and use MFA Duo integrated with PA Global Protect. And then they have asked a specific question saying, can I do this without using a, a Duo proxy? Um, I think we probably need to have a follow-up conversation because there's, there's some part of the question is about uh, the uh, Duo's, the third-party vendor's capabilities. So we probably want to have an offline conversation to, to help you with this question. But uh, on the Palo Alto Networks Global Protect solution, uh, yes, you can have Active Directory and use uh, an MFA uh, in addition to it. Okay. Um, I'm just going through to see uh, this question. What are we doing to protect users or servers when users connect peripherals? For example, someone would plug in a USB that is compromised and protecting that data to infect servers or user machines. Um, again, um, Palo Alto Networks offers a, 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 a comprehensive um, portfolio of security solutions, so we would request you to talk to our account representative to identify which, uh, which solution option would meet this particular use case about protecting endpoints. Um, just to name one, one solution, we have a solution traps, which is used for threat protection on the endpoints. So that could potentially be a solution you may want to look at for this use case. But again, please have the conversation so we can help you with this. And one um, additional comment on having um, an endpoint protection from us, uh, we also can offer an XDR app on top of it. So your stock team is going to be very happy from this choice since we can aggregate all of the logs to the same place and then you can harvest and analyze the data um, across so if you think about the Prisma option, which is cloud, SaaS, endpoint, and our and your network and hardware, now all of the data um, is aggregated into one place for you to work from. So there are many benefits to um, working with us on this project. Thank you for asking this question. Okay, and uh, I think a couple of questions. I think that either uh, either you type the question in a hurry, or for some reason the question looks incomplete. So if we have not answered your question. Uh, it's just that the, the question has not reached us uh, to the extent we can answer it. So please uh, follow up with us after the webinar. And all right. So I think we have gone through almost all the questions, and, and we'll, we'll look for further offline questions. As always, okay. it was a pleasure having you with us today. Um, based on your question, it seems like you are ready to go in and set up a trial, so please do reach out to your partner or account manager or follow out the network reps. They will be more than happy to customize the trial for you, check all of the use case and integration that is needed for your environment. Uh, we wish you a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you in our next webcast. Thank you.